Thank you so much for being a part of what God is doing here. God is an awesome God. So listen, if this is your first Sunday, we are in um, at the second Sunday in this series we've been talking about on identity. And um, today we're going to be going to some interesting places. As I figured out this morning, won't make it through the message in its entirety. So um, we want to invite you to come back. Well, we'll just be here for a little while. Let me say this before I go into the message. Wednesdays are more and more pivotal. And what I mean by that, on Wednesday you get a chance to engage in dialogue, ask questions that you may have, um, things that may not make sense to you. I want to encourage you to write those down. Feel free to email them to me if you can't make it on a Wednesday. But that gives you a chance to, um, for us to engage you and hear what God is saying. Amen? Amen. Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor. Now, y'all got to talk better than that. Come on, say, neighbor. I know who I am. Say, do you? Turn to your other neighbor. Say, other neighbor. I know who I am. Say, do you? Amen. Let me um, review. Um, today is a little different, uh, and let me tell you what I mean by a little different. Uh, more lecture format because I want to share some information that I'm praying that you grasp and you get in your system as we talk about who God is and, and who we are in Christ. We're dealing with the issue of Imago Dei, which means made in the image of God. And we just began this series, so we'll be here for a little while as we kind of flesh through this. Um, and I'll just be honest with you and say this is revolutionizing me and is changing me from who I am and making me into a completely different person. We saw in Genesis chapter 1, uh, when we looked at this, that God created man in his image. In the image of God created he them. Uh, him, male and female, created he them. And then the important thing that I want to emphasize in that passage as we walk through what we're going to be sharing with you this morning is that God gave them dominion. Very, very important for you not to miss this. He blessed them. He gave them dominion over um, everything in the air or the skies above, everything on the earth, and everything in the sea beneath. And I want to really emphasize that point because we'll come back and revisit that as we talk about this concept of our identity in Christ and who we are. We noticed that. Then we saw basically that when we looked at the image of God, we could not have dealt with that thing in its entirety, but we saw that there's three views as it relates to the three views on the image of God. There's substantive view, which basically says that there's capacity within us to, 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 to demonstrate some character traits that God demonstrates. Let me illustrate what I mean by that, the ability to love, the ability to show concern, the ability to be there, to have relationship with each other. Those are the substantive view. The relational view, um, was that? The relational view basically says that being made in the image of God means, and certain theologians hold this view, that I can relate to God, God can relate to me, and we can have interpersonal relationships with each other. Some theologians say that's the aspect of God that the image of God means. The third view is going to sound like something I just said earlier, the functional view. And what the functional view says is that I have abilities to do certain things that the other animals or the animal kingdom don't have capacity or ability to do. For example, I can exercise dominion. Very, very important. Come on, say I can exercise dominion. Y'all talk to me one more time. Say I can exercise dominion. Very, 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 very important concept that I don't want you to miss. These are the three views that kind of summarizes or encapsulates what um, the image of God basically is. Here's a summary statement that I want to read to you. It says that the image itself is that set of qualities of God which reflected in human make relationship and the exercise of dominion possible. You're seeing that word Many, many times. It's going to come up a lot later on today. And next week you're going to hear that word a lot because there's deliverance and there's freedom in there. So if I have the image, it means that there's a set of qualities of God that's in my makeup, that's in your makeup, that's in the makeup of every human that allows us to have relationship and exercise dominion um, over things of the earth. Here's some implications that I wanted you to take away from last week. Number one, you matter to God. Oh, come on, come on, yeah, yeah. Listen, I don't care what they say about you, you matter to God. Come on, say amen. 
that's good news. That's good news because if you're like me, you've been called names. Come on, you've been called all kinds of stuff. But it's exciting to know that you matter to God. Come on, y'all. Come on, come on. Amen, amen. You matter to God. That, that's the good news because here's what that means. that There's nothing you can do to get God to turn his back on you. I can do things that will upset you and make you mad, and your spouse can do things that will upset you, and we can be mad interpersonally. But when it comes to God, I have value. You have value. So much value that he went on that cross of Calvary to die in your place. Come on. That's good news. I mean, the sins that we committed, he was there for us. That's good news. The, the second implication, I'm going to connect it to the first, is that the image of God is universal in mankind. Here's what that means. Let's not make the mistake of thinking that only Christians have the image of God in them. I know you don't want to hear that, but I want you to hear me. So here's what that means. Uncle Bubba and them have the image of God. Aunt Shaniqua. Maybe y'all don't have family members like that. Come on, y'all. Pat Pan them, they're standing on the street corner, right? Here's the good news. It doesn't matter whether they're dr a drug dealer, pink, punk, prostitute, whatever the past is, whatever the current situation is, Genesis says when God created them, he created them in his image. And here's the connection with the value. They don't even know him, but while they were yet sinning, Christ went to Calvary to die for them. Oh, somebody ought to say amen. That's good news. That's good news because here's what you got to lock into me saying. I didn't have to get it right for God to love me. He loved me in spite of because I was made in his image. The people we have issue with matter to God. That's the image, right? Very, very important, very important. And we spent a lot of time last week talking about that. We went to some interesting places on um, Wednesday night. Let me say this one thing to give you a little insight into what happened Wednesday. Um, don't make the mistake, for those of us that think that the image of God is the spirit of God that dwells within us, you're going to have to resolve that biblically because what do you say to the unsafe person who does not have the spirit of God in them? Are they not made in the image? Come on, y'all. You kind of get where I'm going. So what is this image? And, and the, 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 the statement that was put out there, could the image be this thing that you see? And we're going to flesh that out in the upcoming weeks. You are made. But let me just put it this way. You are the image of God. Don't say, I possess. You are. Genesis 1, 26 and 27. Oh, my gosh, that changes things, doesn't it? You are. We are the image of God. So we spent a lot of time talking about that. Now, here's a, a statement that I said. Uh, this statement was about me. Uh, this is where I am in my walk uh, when I'm learning about myself. And I said this morning, and I said again uh, last week, if it fits you, apply it. But what the statement says, what you see of me is my abnormal condition. I'm messed up. You are too. So don't just point the finger, oh, my gosh, what kind of preacher are you? You are too. This is the abnormal condition. So while I am searching for my identity, and the operative term is searching. We're going to flesh that out. While I am searching for my identity, I realize that I am created in the image of God, right? I am I'm made in his image. The problem is, though, is that I am conceived and born in sin. Does that make sense? I am image but I'm born into a world of sin. Psalms 51, conceived in sin, shapen in iniquity. And it says here, as an image bearer, sin is inevitable. Now, this is the shocker today. Sin, you can't avoid it. Okay? We will sin. I will sin. But the good news is redemption is possible. Oh, somebody ought to say man, Yeah. Redemption is possible. I like this a lot. My identity can be confusing. And let me tell you what that means. And, and I kind of talked about this last week. One week I'm holy. The next minute I'm pretending as if I don't know who God is. So it's confusing. And, and here's what we say to each other. Are you Christian or are you not? Well, I'm a child of God, but I have issues. <laughs> right? 
my identity. It may be confusing. It may be confusing. But the good news is I know who I am. And for now, we're using the term I am human. All right? So repeat out of me. Say, I know who I am. I'm a child of the king. Now, let me begin here. And I, I wrote this, this statement that I want, I want to read. I want to read it verbatim um, because I'll be honest with you, um, this week was tough for me. Tough in the sense that as I dug into the message and I'm growing and learning, I am just, I'm messed up right now. I'm messed up. I'm messed up. I am highly convicted as it relates to my walk with God. And I'm in this weird place because I am seeing myself as a complete mess in the presence of God. And the reason I'm saying that, I used to think I was all that. And some of you all used to, well, not used to, you still think. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, not, no, no, you still think, you still think, you still think I'm all that. And, and my prayer is that at the end of the message, you be as jacked up as I am. You know? And we'll all walk out of here like, Lord Jesus. First service, one brother came up to me, man, I should have stayed home, you know. <laughs> but he said it was good. 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 But it's good stuff. So here's what I say. Many people are unable to grasp the concept of sin. The idea of sin as an inner force, an inherent condition, a controlling power is largely unknown. People today think more in terms of sins, that is, individual wrong acts, Sins are something external and concrete. They are logically separated from the person. And on this basis, people who have done nothing wrong, generally conceived of as an external act, consider themselves good. But there is no thought and there's no thought of sin in their lives. Let me explain. Let me explain. What that statement says, if I were to ask the majority of us in here, are you sinning? Here's what we'll say. We'll reflect in our mind, well, I'm not committing adultery. I'm not stealing. I'm not lying. I am not playing with people of the opposite sex. I'm not doing things. And we're saying because I'm not doing something, watch the term, external to who I am, I am not sinning. So I'm intrinsically good. That's the mistake I was making. Are you with me? I'm looking at my life. Today was a good day. Are you with me? And some of us are saying, I had a good week. <laughs> the reason we're saying that is because we don't understand what sin is. And the problem with defining sin is that as culture is shifting, as culture is changing, culture is redefining sin, and the world is being accepting of culture's definition of sin. Here's what it does. It redefines who we are, and we really don't know who we are or whose we are. Our identity is messed up because we listen to the world's definition of sin. All right? Here, this is, this is a, I'm using metaphors. Here's how the world defines sin. Everybody wins. It's like going and playing football where all the kids on the opposing team or the winning team, everybody gets the trophy. In Christianity, everybody does not get, I wish I had. Everybody does not get a trophy. Come on, y'all. In Christianity. There's definition, there's differences, and we want to look at that to see what that is all about. So I want us to take a moment to dig through Scripture, to walk through the Bible. And we won't make it very far. I kind of learned that this morning. I have a lot to share, um, but I just want to begin this process of informing you of, of what um, this is we can talk about. So number one, what is sin? What is sin? What does the Bible say? What are the, what's the biblical perspective on sin? And I only have time today to go to this one thing. We'll talk about the other things that we're going to talk about next week. Let me just start here. If I were to ask the most of us, uh, well, let me, not, let me just define it first. Number one, sin then is an inward inclination. Don't miss that. Inward inclination. Come on, say inward inclination. Say it again. Say inward inclination. It's the inward inclination. It is not merely wrong acts, but sinfulness as well. 
It is an inherent inner disposition inclining us to wrong acts. So hear what that means. By default, there's something in me that challenges me, that presses me, that tempts me to want to do wrong. Default state, okay? So here's what I said this. Motives then, when it comes to sin, it's not so much what I do, but sin begins with what's going on on the inside. And a lot of us don't think that way because my problem and my mistake has been is that I look at what I do and I go, before I go to bed at night, Lord, I thank you for a good day because I didn't do nothing wrong. Come on, church, am I by myself? Oh, come on, can y'all be honest with me? Come on, am I by myself? Do I have a few folk in here that like their pastor has some issues as well? Come on. Don't worry about who's sitting next to you. Just own up, y'all. Fessed up. Come on, say, I got issues. Yeah. And, and, and because I didn't do nothing, I had fooled myself into thinking that I'm not sinning. Are you with me? And, and let, me, let me connect this to identity. When I fool myself into thinking I am who I am not, I fall for the lie of deception and my identity is unknown. Ah. Okay. So watch this. Motives are virtually as important as actions when it comes to the issue of sin. Motives, according to God, are just as important as actions. Where are you going, preacher? Let's look at Scripture. Matthew 5. Go to Matthew 5. Go to Matthew 5. Grab your Bibles or your devices, whatever it is that will take you to Scripture. Matthew 5. And look with me at verse 21. Let's jump there and read that. I want to read. I want to read this so you can see this. Yeah. Matthew 5, 21. Say amen when you're there. Okay. Notice what it says in Matthew 5 and 21. You have heard it was said to those of old, meaning this is what the Old Testament said. You shall not murder and whoever murderers will be liable to judgment. But look at verse 22. Jesus says now, but I say that anyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment and whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council and whoever says you fool or raka will be liable to hell fire. Now, church, listen up, listen up. That's convicting. Because here's what the scripture says. In the Old Testament it says, thou shalt not kill. And here's what we do as good Christians and good church folk. Well, I didn't kill nobody this year. And so we say, I'm good. Jesus says, that was the Old Testament. Let me tell you how the New Testament functions. The New Testament function says, if you use your tongue to go off on anybody, you're just as guilty as the person who committed murder. Come on, y'all, come on. That's convicted. Are you with me? Because some of us have a tongue problem. We might not own any guns. Come on. But, but we, 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 we have a way. Here's what James says. I said this last week. We use our tongues to bless the Lord, but then with the same tongue, we go off on our brothers and sisters who are made in the image of God. And what Jesus is saying, you might lock into the fact that you didn't kill anybody, but lock into this. If you had nerve enough to go off on somebody, to have something negative to say about your brother or sister in Christ, Christ, you're just as guilty. Y'all see why I'm jacked up? Because I done told some folks off. Oh, don't act like it's just me. You have to. Moment somebody cut you off in the street, you don't say, oh, Shonda, praise the Lord. No, you don't. No, I'm telling you, you don't. Amen. I, you take pictures of their license plate. You do all. Come on, y'all. Can we be honest here? Let, let the boss say something that you don't like. You go in the restroom and you don't say, Lord, bless my boss. No, no, no. You get a job performance you don't like. Your attitude, your mind, everything in you goes against God. And what we're seeing, that is an internal disposition, and Jesus calls it sin. 
Come on, y'all. That, 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 come on, y'all. That changes things. Lock into this one. Lock into this one. Look at the next verse. Go down to verse, go down to verse 27. Look at what verse 27 says. This, this one, this one really got me. This one, this one, this one got me. It says here, you have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. Okay? But I say to you that everyone who does what? I'm glad y'all said it. Looks at a woman or man with lustful intent has already committed adultery with him or her in the heart. That one got me. I, now, I'm not saying I got a lust problem, y'all. Don't, don't go there, all right? But I get the message. So I've been walking around all week. Because <laughs> what this says to me, here's what we think. Well, it, ain't nothing wrong. That's what the text says, right? And then I had, I had somebody that was bold enough to say to me this morning, well, doesn't the word say be tempted? I'm being tempted. is not sin, but give. And I said, where does it say that? You know, look, I want you all to flesh this out because what the text is trying to get us to understand is not so much in the doing stuff. It's the thought process that messes us up. I want you to get that. I want you to get that in your mind. So the New Testament is saying, if you just look with lustful intent, imagine, he said that, you might as well have committed the act because it's just as bad. You ain't done nothing yet. Haven't said nothing yet. Amen. One brother said after service, Pastor, what you want me to do, just bump into the walls? <laughs> so bump into the walls, brother. This is why Jesus said, if your eye offends you, do what? Yeah, you get it. Now you're getting it. If your right hand offends you, you don't have to touch. You don't have to say. You don't have to do nothing. But the internal disposition. Pastor Tony, you weren't here first service, but I said, that changes how you watch football now. Amen. 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 Grandma them, grandma them had the song, right? I woke up this morning with what? My mind, what? Stayed on. Because grandma them might not understand the theology of the Imago Day, but they had sense enough to know if my mind is stayed on Jesus, my mind is not distracted with the things of the world. So they say I'm singing and I'm praying with my mind. I'm walking and I'm talking with my mind. They understood the importance of keeping your mind locked in on Jesus because the thought process is sinful in the eyes of God. That changes things. That changes things. Because I used to think I was all that. And now I have to do an introspection. I think you do too. Are you with me? What are you thinking about the person that's sitting in front of you? What are you thinking about the person that lives next to you? What do you think about the person that did you wrong? The Bible calls that sin. Oh, my gosh. So, so I think in the same passage, right, the same passage it says here, look at verse 23, look at verse 23. So if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that you had somebody had done something against you, look at what it says in 24, leave your gift there in the altar and go first and be reconciled. Here's what we used to think, well, I didn't wrong nobody, so let me just go ahead and worship because there ain't nothing wrong. What the text is trying to say, if you came to the altar and you've been having ill thoughts, you need... Annette, just forgive me, girl. I love you. What I do? Don't worry about it. It was in my head. Okay? And then come on back. Yeah. You, you get the picture. They might not even know. But God. Here's another perspective. Man looks where? At the outward appearance. But God looks where? So here's what happens. Sometimes the most holy people have the most filthiest minds. But you never know because we don't ever see them doing anything, but we have no idea what they're thinking. And I want us to hear. So 
Sin is internal. Come on, all you it begins internal. We're going to go several places with that, okay? It is not simply that we are sinners because we sin. We sin because we are sinners. That's the tension. I'm made in the image of God. I am conceived and born into sin. How do I resolve this conflict? How do I resolve this? And we'll spend some time talking about that in the upcoming weeks. Very, very important. Let me move on and let me make this statement here. So sin now is a lack of conformity, active or passive. Don't, know, know, don't miss that. Active or passive to the moral law of God. That, this may be a matter of act, thought. You see thought? Or inner disposition or state. Sin is failure to live up to what God expects of us in act, thought, and being. Come on, say amen if this makes sense. Come on, y'all, y'all don't like it, but say amen if it makes sense. Very, very important, okay? So look at them, I'm moving. Sin then is rebelliousness and disobedience. Adam and Eve in the garden, right? God said to them um, in Genesis chapter 3, don't eat the fruit of the, this tree because if they eat of it, you're going to die. Leave the serpent leave Satan out of the picture. Something in them caused them to disobey God. They had to process that before they did it. Something in them told them or caused them to disobey God. This one is critical. Sin entails spiritual disability. So here's what that means. When I sin, I render myself spiritually disabled, okay? Let me keep going. And it alters my inner condition, my character. In sinning, we become twisted or distorted, and the image of God in which we are created is disturbed. So listen to this. Let me explain. I'm made in the image of God. I am conceived and born into sin. So whenever I sin, I compromise this image. And I'm causing the image to do some things. That God did not intend. Are oh, you getting that, preacher? Go to Romans. Let's go to Romans. Go to Romans. Y'all go to Romans with me. Let me read. Go, go to Romans. Romans chapter 1. Let's all go there. This one I, I have to read. Romans chapter 1. This will make sense to you. Romans 1. And bear with me as I read this thing in its entirety because I want us to see what this says. You guys doing all right out there? I told you all I'm messed up, right? Yeah, this is, this, is, this is some convicting stuff. Say amen if you're in Romans chapter 1. Notice what it reads. It says this. For the wrath of God is being revealed or poured out from heaven against all godliness and unrighteousness of mankind. Who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what may be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. Let me stop for a moment. Here's what that scripture says. There's not a person on the face of the earth can say they don't know or that God exists. And they, not a person on the face of the earth can say they don't know the difference between right and wrong. Not a person on the face of the earth. Because this scripture is clear. God has shown it to them. Let me go here. There's not a person on the face of the earth that can convince me of the fact that God does not speak to them. Here's the mistake we make. We believe that because we love God, we're the only somebody that God speaks to. But the issue of conscience, right, that could potentially be an image thing. Everyone who does wrong knows what wrong is because God says it's wrong. This scripture confirms this. Let me show you some things. Let me keep going. Verse 20, for his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power, divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made so that they are without excuse. Although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. They exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Look at verse 24. Therefore, the text says, because we ignored God, 
God gave them up to the lust of their hearts, to impurity, to dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie. And watch this, worship and serve the creature rather than the creator, creator who is forever to be played, praised. For this reason, look at verse 28. God gave them up to the dishonorable passions. Their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. Y'all know what that means? Y'all know what that means, right? Women start, stopped doing natural things and started doing unnatural things. Let me break it down even further. Where it's natural to be attracted to a man... They started being, y'all get it, right? y'all get it, y'all yeah, get it, unnatural, right? And, and here's the lie. Culture is saying everybody wins. It's okay. And my problem is the church is becoming accepting of it, and I'm standing before you to say it's a lie. Let's not just stop with the women. Brothers, let's, let's get the brothers. Let's get the brothers. Notice what it says, verse 27. And the men likewise have gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another. Lord, have mercy. Men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves a due penalty of their error. Isn't that, y'all know what that says, right? Because we're ignoring God and we're starting to redefine what morality is, God has turned his back on it. Okay, I'm going to show you something in a little while. And we are making the mistake culturally of saying what God calls unnatural, we are now calling natural. And hear me out. Image bearers are image bearers. And if I'm made in the image of God, there is expectation that I behave, I function, I act like God, not like the way the world says God function, acts, or behaves. It's, come on, y'all, talk to me, talk to me. Is this making sense? I don't want to offend nobody, but sin is sin, and we've got to deal with it, okay? Now, now before, before, before y'all get too holy on me and start saying, not me, I want to connect the dot. Because look at the text, look at the text. It says, since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, he gave them up to a debased mind. So a depraved mind, some of your translation says, and to do things what they ought not do. And they were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They're full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness, gossips. And 30 gives you a whole list. Now, I read all that to say this. Here's a problem we make as a church. We look at someone's external sin, and we say, sinner. And we ignore our internal sin, and we say, holy. <laughs> I asked Pastor Katani yesterday, I said, baby, what's the difference between lying and being homosexual? Yeah, you get it. Yeah, y'all look at me like, what in the world? Sin is sin, right? What's the difference between stealing and being an adulterer or, you know, you, you kind of get where I'm going, or LGBT, whatever, you, whatever terms you want to use. What's the, but here's what we'll do as a church. We will stop loving people because of how they behave, and we neglect looking at ourselves on the inside. I wish I had somebody of the things that go on in our mind and then deceive ourselves into thinking that is not sin, that is. Well, baby, in the eyes of God, it's all sin, external or internal. Hear me say this, hear me say this, hear me say this. Don't fool yourself into thinking that Jesus went to Calvary only to die for those people. No, no, no. Our thought was sin. The way we conduct ourselves is sin internally. And the same Christ who died on Calvary for the homosexual is the same Christ who died on Calvary for you, the liar. God doesn't love you more because you don't steal. 
God doesn't love you more because you don't commit murder. Come on. God doesn't love you more because you're female and you love another female. He loves us all the same regardless of the sin that we commit. It's sin, and the church ought to behave like God. We have to behave like God, but if you don't understand what sin is, you'll think you're exempt. I'll look at you and see what you're doing, but I won't look at me and see what I'm thinking. Is this making sense? And God looks at all of us, and all of us as image bearer. And while we're focused on the outside, he locks into the inside. And here's what he says to the church. How dare you? Have you looked in the mirror lately? And here we are as a church. I don't understand why they just stuck on drugs and they can't be delivered. And God is saying, I don't understand how you can be so holy and think of them like that. Because when I see them, I see image bearers. So I go to Calvary for them. When I see you, I see image bearer. So I go to Calvary for you. When I see sin, I see sin. And I go for Calvary for the sin, internal, external, or otherwise. It's sin to me. So Matthew says it's internal. Roman says that when we do so much, it becomes the prey. But I want you to hear me say God loves us all. Does that make sense? Here's a quick one. I'm almost there. Sin is an incomplete fulfillment of God's standards. That means we may simply fall short of the norm. Whenever we fall short of the norm that's set, that's sin. Okay, here's two examples. When God sent Samuel to go inhabit the land, he said, kill everything, don't keep nothing alive. He kept the king. He kept some good stuff. And God said, because you didn't completely obey me, that is sin. Come on, say completely obey. Say it again. Say completely obey. The second example is in Malachi, right? It says, bring the tithes into the storehouse that they may meet. And here's what some of us do. We feel because it's New Testament, I need to obey certain things. And whenever we do partially what God says to do completely, we're sinning. That's difficult. You guys, are, you guys are all right? Very, very important. Very, very important that we, we not miss this. I'm, I'm, I'm almost there. I want to go to the last thing. Sin is displacement of God, number five. Meaning, if I place anything first or in front of God, I am sinning. Here's what Exodus says. I, the Lord your God, I'm what kind of a God? Jealous God. You shall have no other God before me. So watch this. Choosing finite objects over God is wrong no matter how selfless we may think it is. If I put anything, my wife, my job, my, my whatever it is in front of God, and I worship the created thing more than the creator, I am sinning. Mark says it this way. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. And the second commandment is this. Love your neighbor as your wife. So guess what? If I start thinking negative about my neighbor, I'm not loving them like how to love self. And I'm sinning. You ain't done nothing yet, just not love, and God calls it sin. Oh boy, this is tough. This is tough, right? And as long as the enemy can keep erasing the definition of sin in our minds, we'll create this false identity. So here's my opening statement. My identity is confusing. Until I fully know who I am, y'all going to get this when we get to this part of the series. You don't want to miss this. Then I start behaving like who I really am. I used to, I used to play basketball. Well, I, I claim I still, I still, I play basketball. Yeah. I don't care how old I am. Amen. Speak that thing into being. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. But I used to get angry with professional basketball players because they walk in the room and they carry the air of arrogance about themselves because they know they could play. You kind of get what I'm saying? So when they walk in the room, they all bad, palming the ball, all that good stuff, you know. And I couldn't palm the ball, so I look at them with an attitude because I knew I wanted to be like that. They knew who they were. I didn't. 
In Christianity, that's my problem. That's your problem. If our identity is not clearly defined, we'll be faking the funk. Very, very important. Okay? You guys got this? Is it making sense? Okay. Let me go on. Let me go on. Let me, let me do this and then I'll stop. I got to stop because time runs out. This just gets juicy. So then, what is the source of sin? Where does sin come from? If I were to poll you and say, hey, restoration, what's the source of sin? Where majority of you in here would probably respond, the tempter, the enemy, the devil. We'd probably respond to something to that effect. But lock into this. The problem lies with the source of sin. And this is one. There's a few more I'm going to share with you next week. It lies in the fact that humans are sinful by nature. And we live in a world in which powerful forces seeks to induce us to sin. Here's what that means. Even though I'm made in the image, my default state is sinner. And so everything in me forces me to want to sin. Here's a giveaway. Until I learn to exercise dominion, the forces are going to continue to win. I hope you're seeing by now, I'm not just telling you dominate the things you do. I'm trying to teach you to dominate the thing the way you, yeah, you're starting to get it. Yeah. Y'all learn so fast. You get it, okay? Let's keep moving. I want to stop here. I want to go ahead and stop. I want to see a couple of things. So let me start here. Don't make the mistake of saying that God is the source of sin. Don't make that mistake. God cannot create sin. Amen? God cannot create sin. Give me about five more minutes, I'll be done. God cannot create sin. Does that make sense? Go with me to James. Go to the book of James. Let's just read this real quick. Last scripture I want to show you. James chapter 1. Yeah, James chapter 1. I like that brother over there. Amen. Amen. Deacons, that's how you do it, man. You talk to the preacher. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I like that. Yeah. James, yeah. James, look at, look at James. Look at James. Look at James real quick. Look at verse 13 of the book of James. You guys are there? Say amen if you're there. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted, being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. Does that make sense to you guys? Come on, look up at me. So responsibility for sin then is placed based on James squarely at the door of the individual. So I can't start off by saying yet the devil is tempting me, okay, because let me, listen to me carefully. Because here's what we said. Being tempted is not sin. Yielding to the temptation is sin. Hear me out. Who is tempting you if the devil is not tempting you? You kind of, you, you, you see how this works, right? So, so if I have to take responsibility, then I got to deal with me. So look at what James says. Look at verse 14. Look at verse 14. But each one is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his what? own desire, then desire, when it is conceived, give birth to what? Sin, and then sin, when it is full grown, it does what? It gives birth to death. Let me stop here. Look at that. Sin is caused, number one, this is one cause, by our own internal struggles and is self-explicted when we distort natural desires given by God. The issue of choice. Let me help you all with that. Let me help you all with that. God is omnipotent. God is omniscient. And God is omnipresent. Let me tell you what that means. God has all power in his hand. Come on, y'all. God knows everything. And God is everywhere at the same time. You kind of get what I'm saying. The reason I put on there the issue of choice because I am made in the image of God, let me, hear me carefully, there's an aspect of me 
even though I am not God, where I can function in omnipotence, I can function in omniscience, and I can function in omnipresence. Somebody's saying, dang, preacher, where you getting all that from? Here's where I'm going. The power of the mind. Okay? I can't do it literally and physically like God, but mentally and internally, I have fooled myself into thinking I can. Yeah, I don't get it. So here's what that means. I have choice. I am here right now, and I say to myself, you know what? I'm going to Disneyland. I'll be back, y'all. I could stand here talking to you physically, but mentally, I could be driving down Rodeo Drive. Oh, come on, talk to me. I could be looking at the stars that are on the sidewalk, mentally. Come on, y'all. I could describe stars that I've seen, come on, because I've been there in the past, and the power of memory or recollection takes me there. Come on, y'all. Some of y'all have already taken the trip with me, and you're still sitting here. Some of y'all are saying, well, what about Disneyland? What about Universal Studio? Because even though you're still here, you're thinking about L.A. Come on. The mind takes you places. And because of the power of the mind, we go places, we think things, we make choices, we abhor, uh, what you call it, we distort the good things of God for our own pleasure. Let me help y'all out. Food is good. Come on, y'all. Nothing wrong with food. But the design of food is not overeating. It's survival. But if you're in church and you're thinking about Cheesecake Factory <laughs> and what you're going to order on the menu, are you thinking about that carrot cake cheesecake or that caramel? You see how I'm taking you places in your mind? Come on. Some of y'all going to leave here at the church. I, I didn't want it, but I want it now. Hey, y'all. <laughs> Because of the power of the mind. And here's what will happen. We won't eat enough just to stay alive. We'll mess around and overeat. And I'm saying to you, whenever we distort what God initially intended, we are sinning. And so lock into this. What's the difference with a bunch of fat Christians in church and you've got the gay person that's sitting over here? What's the difference? What's the difference? Come on. Oh, look at the guy on the keys. His wrists all bent. Well, heck, look at the worship leader. What he been eating? What's the difference? It's sin. Let me give y'all one more. Let me give y'all one more. Let me give one more. This is my favorite one. Sex is good. Shanda. It's good. It's good. It's good. It is. Y'all know I'm right about it because you like it too. But it is only good in the bounds of marriage. So here's what happens. You walking down the street, and you see something. And that thing done got imprinted in your mind. Are you with me? Or maybe it's a person you work with. Maybe it's a person you engage. Then you go home, and you're in the private chamber with your spouse. And here's what your mind does. It leaves the bedroom. Y'all know I'm telling the truth. Y'all know y'all just holy, that's all. <laughs> And then it goes back to what you saw. Come on. And then all of a sudden, in your mind, you are making your spouse become. That's sin. That's sin. I mean, that's why Scripture says don't lust after another man's wife or not. Come on, y'all get it? You kind of get what I'm saying? But here, here's, here's the lie. Here's the lie. Well, at least we ain't doing nothing. Well, you're thinking it. 
Are you with me? If, if you're, and I'm not saying nobody here. I'm just giving you some practical stuff to think about. If you're the type of person that have to look at pornography to engage in relationship with your spouse, something is wrong. If you got to think about something else, something is wrong. The enemy has you, and it's sin, and we need deliverance. Lock into this. Nothing external. It's all internal. It's stuff that we have done to ourselves. I am my worst enemy. You are your worst enemy. And as long as the enemy can blind you to you, you're going to win all day long. So here's my dominion piece. I'm going to pick this up next week. We have to learn to exercise dominion. So you walking down the street and you didn't have your Bible, so you couldn't do and you saw that thing. Then when night come and you in a room with your spouse and your memory goes there, here's what the Bible says in Corinthians 2. Take it captive. Hold up, baby. I go find my Bible real quick. <laughs> All right, let's go. <laughs> I'm sorry, y'all. Submit it to the things of Christ. Don't play with it. Don't fool yourself. Come on, is this making sense? Is this making sense? Because if I can keep you, if the devil can keep us living the false you, our identity is not defined. So you can say, I know who I am all day long. Now you'll appreciate why I said at the end of my statement, I am human. I've got to transcend my humanity to be in, in the image of God and learn how to live there. But i got to be honest with who I am today before I can become who God wants me to be. The problem with you and the problem with me, we fool ourselves into thinking we're sons and daughters of God and we don't know what that means. Don't know what it means. And it's time to change some things. So here it is, here it is. Satan... Excuse the grammar. You is a lie. <laughs> Are you with me? Because we're learning. We're knowing. We're understanding what God wants done. And we have to be different. Come on, bow your heads with me.